Um, let's go on to Ishbitz. Um, in your book, you discuss the controversial and difficult doctrines of Ishbitz. Antinomianism is a very dangerous and paradoxical doctrine, which seems to go against the most intuitive notions of free will and personal responsibility. You have a um, uh, you have delved into uh, Ishbit's philosophy into, um, uh, for, for a number of years. Firstly, can you explain to our audience the idea of antinomianism and how you would understand the true intent of Ishbit's Hasidus in regards to this? Secondly, we wanted your original opinion on why this doctrine did not, in fact, seem to negatively affect the Ishbit's community in terms of their approach in Judaism. And as some might have expected it to, such as with the uh, Sabbateens. That's a, that's a mouthful. You packed yeah. it a lot there. Let's break it down one by one. So what does the word antinomianism mean? It comes from two words. Anti means against. Nomos means the law. It is the breakdown of the law. It is not a religious question exclusively. It is a question that animates all of society. You know, we have these raging political debates about how we should set up our economy. On one side of the ledger, let's say over here, you have very strong um, market laissez-faire capitalists who believe that, you know, the, the economy should, as little government regulation as possible, uh, no government involvement, let people just do business and get out of their way. And then on the other hand of the scale is something called uh, more of a socialism, the welfare state where the government is intimately involved and, you know, maybe in some forms there isn't the, even uh, private ownership, but there is this social safety net that allows everybody idealistically to, to get exactly what they, what they need. You know, what, what Mark said, you know, each according to their needs or each according to their lot, whatever he said. And both of these systems, if we know and we live in the world, have difficulties to them. You live in a purely capitalist economy, and God forbid you grow up in poverty. God forbid, you know, an illness strikes and you don't have insurance. It could destroy a person's life. It could destroy a person's life. Um, on the other side, it, it's, it's for me, many people, you, it's the best way to, to be able to make a living. So we live in the United States in a, in a mixed economy. We have government regulations. We have government interventions, we have welfare, we have social security, we have Medicaid, Medicare, we have some of the basic social safety nets. But in a pure capitalist society, none of that exists. I would compare that to a world that is all of Bechira. In a world that is just free will, that only emphasizes one's free will, um, you could live in a world where the question is when something bad happens to you, did God will that to happen? Because the same way that there is a paradox in the way that we should set up the economy, there is a paradox in the way the grand economy of the world, of the, of the olam, in its totality should be set up. On the one hand, we believe God knows everything and sees everything. On the other hand, we believe that I have my own volition to do what I want. It is the paradox that's known as Yediyah, which is God's divine foreknowledge, and Bechira, which is my free will. These also stand at two sends, the same way that socialism and capitalism does. On the one hand, you can live in a world that is all Bechira. In a world that is all Bechira, then I could pick up a gun, and there are Rishonim who feel this way, I could pick up a gun and shoot you in the head, God forbid, and when somebody comes and says, how could this happen? You can't talk about God. You can't say that there's a divine plan. You can't say that our Baruch Hu knows his ways and is mysterious, all the things that we say. You could say, like Toso seems to say in Ksubos, like many Rishonim seem to say, free will, what can you do? On the other hand of the ledger, there is something called Yediyah, where we say, no, maybe our Bechira is limited. It's not limiting God's divine foreknowledge, which some Rishonim do, but it's limiting our, our Bechira, our free will. We don't have as much free will as you thought. 
So there are dangers in that also. There are dangers in a socialist economy. What's the dangers in a socialist economy? Why show up to work? I'm going to get food anyways. Why, why innovate? Why create? I have food coming to me anyways. There's a comfort in that world. The comfort in that world is you always have the safety net. You're never going to fall down and collapse and, and not know what to do with you. You're never going to, God forbid, and I'm sorry I just threatened you with murder. We don't have to use you in the next example. But, you know, if something terrible happens in the world, you could look up and they say there's somebody running the world. Somebody running the world. I, I don't know the answer, but, but this was also HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Now, most of us are in the middle, both in our economic policy and in our religious policy. We, we, we dance with both terms. Now, there's Bechira, there's Yudhiya. We're not really reckoning with the paradox. Seemingly, that's the way the Rambam deals with it. What Isbits, I believe, and I understand, and my understanding is very limited, is Isbits lives on both ends of the court. Isbits feels that they're the only way to access the world of radical Yidea, of radical divine knowledge, is through radical Bechira, through radical self-determination, agency, thinking. And it is only through that lens that I am able to enter the orchards of God's divine foreknowledge. The, the reason why antinomianism comes up is because if God knows everything and we live in that world and you can live in that world, then we say it all the time, then I could sin, I could steal, I could pillage, I could murder. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu still loves me. Still, I'm still a part of HaKadosh Baruch Hu's plan. So in that world, there, it leaves room for antinomianism. Because every expression, my whole life is an expression of God. So anytime I do anything, it's an expression of God, including sin. And this is what happened with Shabtai Tzvi. Shabtai Tzvi believed in accessing and living exclusively in that higher plane of just Yedea and accessing that Eloke Yisroel, where everything is a reflection of God and deliberately sin is a reflection of God. And it's actually an expression of God's love for us, the immutability of his love when I sin, because I'm showing you the limits and I'm extending the boundary of God's love. I believe Ishbitz avoided this, even though they came pretty close, because they address it in the introduction to the Me'ashiloach. In the introduction to the Me'ashiloach, he writes that the words in this book are only for Anshe Shlomenu, for our community. A lot of these more radical fringe views happen when these ideas stick in your head and there's this loneliness and individuality and you're not thinking about the consequences of community. Ishbitz believed that if it's not mediated from the sensitivities that emerge, particularly on the communal level, they're going to become radicalized. The same way that halacha can become radicalized, if somebody sat in your basement for five years learning all of your halacha books, how to keep Shabbos, how to keep Yontif, how to keep Yontif that falls out on Shabbos, Shabbos that falls out on Tisha B'av, and all the Sfarim and all the everythings. And they came out after five years, they would not be a functioning Orthodox Jew. They would be so fahitz meshugana with every footnote and every detail, they'd be paralyzed. Oh my God, page eight. Oh my God. They, they wouldn't be able to move. They'd be stuck. <coughs> they would be radicalized to a certain extremism by themselves <laughs> because their halachic education wasn't tempered through communal experience. And in that same way, it's true with theology. Theology needs to be tempered through communal experience. And if you read Hasidic works by themselves and they live alone in your head, and they're not tempered with the Knesset Yisroel and the larger body of a community, you're going to get radicalized. But if you avoid that by making sure that theological ideas are always tethered to communal expression. I know that was a very long answer, and I, I, I really packed in a lot there. It was but, a very but this long is question. the world that everybody lives in. It was a long question, so we deserve that. Yes. Thank you. You actually really uh, covered that because you did address that in the book. Um, did you have anything else to add on? The book? Um, no, I think you answered everything really well. And it's I, I 
I can tell from your expressions now that I did not do a good job, but, but we're, I'm more no, than happy to move on. You're like, um, no, I, I, I was just reflecting on your, on what you were saying um, about how, uh, how the communal aspect tempers things. And I, yes. I think that that's all across the board outside of just Ishmael's like you related with halacha and in yes. general in all matters, actually. Yes. I think yes. that communal, communal, communal experience really is like the heart and soul of Judaism to some extent. Yes. It's what keeps everything together. You know what I mean? So yes. I appreciated that answer a lot. That's what I was. That's very kind of you. Checking about. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. okay. So we're going to go to the.